Hi everyone, this is the video that goes with chapter two of our um, textbook, The um, Beginnings of the Biological Basis of Behavior, um, and it goes up through um, prenatal development and birth. Um, so um, before we get into that, I want to just um, sort of recap a little bit of last week. Um, we talked about different theories, or we were exploring different theories. Um, and when you think about somebody's behavior, you sit next to somebody in a restaurant, you're behind somebody in line, um, and they're, they have a behavior that might be annoying to you or interesting to you in some way. Um, what do you think the cause of their behavior is, right? If there's a if there's a crying child or somebody who's arguing with a you know with a uh, a store person or a server, um, what do you think that the cause of their behavior was? And if you think that the cause of their behavior um, had to do with some unconscious motivations or frustrations, then you might uh, be leaning toward a psychodynamic theory um, as your internal theory of uh, of development. Um, if you think it's something about the way they were thinking about something and maybe they um, just need to think about it differently, that's a cognitive approach. Um, if you think that in the past those behaviors have worked for them and so um, they're tending to rely on behaviors that have worked and that have been, um, that have been reinforced, um, so perhaps a child could be crying um, and then the parents capitulate and give the child what they want, um, which isn't always a bad idea, um, but if that's your view of how, that, uh, how development is progressing, that's a behaviorist view. Um, if you think it's genetic um, and it's just sort of they were born that way, that's more of an evolutionary view or perhaps an epigenetic view. So when you think about developmental psychology over the course of this semester, think about what kind of a developmental psychologist you are. Um, this semester you are one, um, and so it's good to know sort of what your, it's not, um, bias seems to be a, has a negative connotation, but we all have a bias. I certainly have one. Um, I know that uh, I have a go-to when I'm trying to explain somebody's behavior to myself or understand it, um, and then I'll correct for it because I know other theories. And so it could also be this, and it could also be that. Um, and so I hope by the end of the semester, you will have internalized those theories to the extent that you can use them or, to, or so that you can use them um, in your own life, in your own careers. Uh, okay, so um, the book talks about um, Darwin's theory or starts talking about Darwin's theory in the beginning of the chapter, um, you know, adaptation, right? So, um, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, the, the idea that certain qualities are uh, have, a, have an advantage um, and the people that had those qualities or had those genes or had those capabilities were more likely to have survived um, and so through that process, we have evolved in certain ways. So when you think about something like depression, um, you would think that, all things being equal, uh, people who are uh, suffer from major depression would be less likely than people who don't, perhaps, to, um, to have a successful relationship and have children and pass their genes on to the next, um, to the next um, uh, generation. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't ever, but less likely. And over time, over many, many, many um, hundreds and thousands of generations, you would have thought that if that had a genetic component, that uh, it would no longer be present in the population, that, that that doesn't have an adaptive quality. But then when you think about it, it's like, well, it is still part of our um, genetic inheritance, so why? What are, the, uh, what are the adaptive capabilities that go along with um, depression or some of the some of the symptoms of depression. So you know, I'm not here to say, oh, it's, you know, you're depressed. That's good. Um, but I am here to say that perhaps um, you know some of the qualities that are associated with um, you know retreating a little bit from society, um, ruminating, thinking about uh, thinking about things. Those things can be positive as well as negative. They can be strengths as well as uh, as challenges. So um, just keep that in mind as you're reading. Um, there's an example that I put in the slides about using um, the the example of flour um, to stand for genes. Um, if you have a bag of flour, you can make a lot of things with that. You can make cookies with that. You can make cakes with that. You can make tortillas with that. You can make you know, flatbreads with that. You can make all kinds of things with, with flour. Um, so knowing that you have the genes, the flour, doesn't tell you very much about how, you know, what the finished product is going to look like. <clears throat> and when you look at the finished product, it's hard for you to determine how much of it had to do with the flour and how much of it had to do with butter and water and temperature and, and those other things. So um, keep that in mind when you're thinking about the role of genes in development. Um, it does have a role, they do have a role, but they are not deterministic. You know, biology is not our destiny, and you'll hear that um, several times throughout this course.
Um, okay, so um, when, when the book starts to talk about um, genes and um, genetic inheritance, um, we're going to take a, a pretty high level view of most aspects of physical development in this um, in this course. Um, and so I'm not expecting you to know all the ins and outs of you know recessive and dominant genes and and all of that. Um, just sort of you know use it as a as a reminder um, of what uh, how genes contribute to our uh, who we are, right? Our genotype. Um, the um, the Human Genome Project. Um, now that we are familiar with genetic testing and understanding that there are certain genes that are associated with certain diseases, um, and that and we're getting more and more information about that every year, um, it seems in hindsight to be fairly fairly obvious. But there was a time where people said, "You want to map the entire human genome? You'll never be able to do that." And then they did it, right? So um, so we're learning more and more about genes. Um, what we knew when I was in graduate school. Um, 20 years ago, um, far less than what we know today, obviously. Um, and five years from now or 10 years from now, you may look back on this course and say, wow, we learned this, that was wrong. It's like, well, of course it's wrong because that's how science works. Um, we're constantly um, looking for more information and once we get that, we're looking for more information about that. So um, I hope that we'll get the kinds of progressions that will lead you to, to say about this course. It's like, wow, we've really made some progress since then, um, depending on how long it is um, before you start looking back on this one. Um, but we're just getting started, so we're not looking back on it yet. Um, sources of variability, um, you know, uh, identical twins, monozygotic twins, and dizygotic twins. A lot of what we know about behavioral genetics or about the genetic uh, contribution to some of these things um, has come from twin and adoption studies. So um, identical twins share 100% of their DNA. Um, dizygotic or fraternal twins um, share about half of their DNA. Um, that's the same that you, if you have a sibling, um, the only difference between two siblings and fraternal twins is that some were born on the same day and some were born years apart. Um, you share about 50% of your DNA with them. And so um, there've been a lot of studies trying to unpack or, or disentangle the genetic component to certain vulnerabilities and behaviors, diseases, um, you know, just sort of how that all works. And so when you think about that, we have a genotype and then we have a phenotype. Just because you have the genes for certain things does not mean that you will have that thing. Um, some people are taller, some people are shorter. Um, it has to do with genes, but it also has to do with the environment and nutrition and um, the prenatal environment, so all kinds of things. So anything that we talk about as having a genetic component, it's all, almost always, always, almost always. So I, I go back and forth. There are a few things for where the, if you have a gene, um, you're going to have a disease. But for most things in psychology, it's polygenic. Um, there are a number of genes that all contribute to that one thing. So there's not a gene for um, being uh, social or antisocial. There's not a gene for shyness. Um, but there are genes that contribute to that. Um, and so in that sense, they are polygenic. Um, but it's not just genes. It's also environment and, and many other things. So and your interaction between genes and the environment. Um, so it's multifactorial. It, it depends on a multiple of factors. Um, but it's also polygenic um, in that it's a it's a multitude of genes. So multifactorial is the big umbrella, and then polygenic um, is the idea that it's not a one gene, one behavior, or one trait um, kind of relationship. Um, okay, um, so um, there, in the slides, there are a few examples of genetic contributions, um, and I'll just go over maybe one or two of them. Um, for um, angry emotionality, there's a slide that has to do with that. Um, for if, if uh, twins were raised together or raised apart, if they're identical, they share 100% of their DNA, they're identical twins, they're very similar on that, right? So it didn't seem to matter whether they were raised in the same home or a different home. They may have never met each other until adulthood, um, but they were raised in different homes and yet their similarity is the same, uh, whether they were um, raised together or raised apart. So that suggests that there's a strong genetic contribution and a not very strong environmental contribution. Fraternal twins were less similar um, if they were raised together and almost not similar at all if they were raised apart. And so that, again, talks about um, the, the contribution um, of genes to that particular behavior. Um, temperament we're going to talk about more in the next chapter uh, when we, or the next couple of chapters when we talk about early childhood. Um, so I'll skip over temperament for now, but um, temperament is an early precursor to personality. Um, and so we'll get into that more, but there is definitely a biological component um, to, uh, to temperament. Um, and then um, the cycle of violence. You would think that um, a child who was maltreated uh, would be the least likely person as an adult to maltreat their own children, to, to, to um, 
to abuse their own children, and yet that's not what we find. There is a cycle of violence, and so um, researchers have been trying to understand that and try and unpack that, and one of the things they found is there are genes associated with that kind of behavior. If you have the gene, um, then you're more likely to, to engage in that only if you were also maltreated as a child. Um, so there, there are people that have the gene or a low level of the gene, people that have a high level of the gene. Um, you know, if they were not maltreated as children, not very much difference. But if they were maltreated, if they were, uh, if they were subjected to severe maltreatment, um, then it goes off in, in widely different directions. And so um, that, that's um, the, the explanation or that's an example of um, the role of epigenesis or epigenetics um, when we talk about development. There's an interaction between genes and environment. You can have a gene that's never expressed um, and you know it depends on the environmental trigger um, to, to cause that gene to be expressed. So I am not a geneticist um, and so anything that, that you learn in this class you're going to learn more about and, uh, and much more about if you take a course in genetics um, later on in your academic career. Um, okay, um, so um, then the, the next thing that uh, in the book talks about um, uh, heredity environment correlations and gene environment interactions. Um, and so they sound very similar, but they're different. So the first one is Sandra Scar's research. She's talking about um, the environment and your heredity and how those can be a good fit. So we call it um, goodness of fit. So if your biological parents were pretty shy um, and you're pretty shy, then growing up in their home, you would, uh, they would understand your behavior um, and they would probably provide an environment for you that is consistent with um, the, the best developmental environment for a child who's shy, right? They understand what it's like to be shy. They understand that their child is shy. That's a passive genotype environment correlation. The child didn't have to do anything. The parents provided that because the parents shared their genes and because of that, they understood that and shared some of those characteristics. Now, it could be the case that one parent is shy and the other parent is not, but at least one of the parents, if they're the biological parents, is likely to, to understand that. Um, evocative means that um, the child is evoking from the environment um, certain kinds of reactions. And so um, a child who um, is relatively um, easygoing, laughs a lot, um, makes easy transitions from, you know, from playing to eating to, to um, going to bed to cleaning up toys, um, that child is going to evoke different kinds of uh, responses from um, their caregivers. If they're in a preschool situation, for example, um, the preschool teachers are going to enjoy talking to them and they're going to banter back and forth with them. That child's going to get a lot of positive feedback. The child who has a really hard time with those transitions cries a lot. Um, people are going to be just a little bit more cautious around them. It's like, hey, don't wake the baby. The baby's going to cry. Uh, and that's a different way of interacting with your world. And so from the very earliest ages, um, those evocative, you know, you're evoking from the, uh, from the environment certain kinds of reactions, and then that fuels what happens next, this contingent responding. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about how people develop um, and how they have developed um, from, from birth. Um, and then the last one from SCARS research is active, and that's where um, increasingly as you get older, you're able to select environments that you like. Um, if you like you know, big classes, then you can select a big class in college. Um, if you prefer smaller classes and more one-on-one -on -one attention, you can do that. If you prefer um, online so that you have more choice about when you interact with people, you can select that. And that's active um, genotype environment. So the thing that fits best with your personality could be the thing that, uh, that you do, that you seek out. Um, if you like, um, you know, going to clubs where there are lots and lots of people and there's lots of noise, um, then you can seek that out and you can, you know, that's, a, that's that active um, genotype environment correlation. Um, you, genetically, you were more predisposed to being perhaps more outgoing um, and then you found these kinds of, these kinds of um, places um, to express that. Um, the second part is the gene environment interaction and that's epigenesis. So um, I posted an infographic um, that you can look at um, and epigenesis is just that bi-directionality. Um, that you know, genes are influenced by the environment, the environment influences the genes and the expression of those, um, and there's this, sort of this um, bi-directional influence there. Um, the, um, the next thing that, uh, that we go into are, uh, is prenatal testing and then prenatal development. So when you're thinking about prenatal testing, um, there's some 
questions that come up that I don't actually uh, use in, in online courses, um, but I do use them in seated classes, where I ask students to, to uh, divide up into small groups and talk about some things. Um, it's harder to do in an online course um, because some of these are really thorny issues, and you never know who in the class has had um, an experience with this um, that might be difficult for them to think about or talk about. And so I really don't want to put this in an open, uh, open forum discussion. Um, but I will say, you know, think about, um, you know, when you think about IVF, um, in vitro fertilization, um, more embryos are being created than will be used um, generally because you don't know how many of those embryos might be viable. So um, perhaps 12 might be created or eight might be created um, because if only six of those are viable, at least you've got six that are viable, where if you only created two and neither one of those were viable, you would need to start over. And you may already know this, but, um, but uh, assisted reproductive technologies are very, very expensive. So, um, you know, people would prefer to not, and they're also um, cut pretty hard on the body uh, for, both the, the, for both partners. So, um, um, so if more embryos are created than needed, um, what happens to the other embryos, right? So they can be frozen, they can be stored. Um, what happens if the couple divorces? What happens, you know, there, there are a lot of issues, um, ethical issues, personal issues um, surrounding all of that. Um, it gets into the press almost every year. There's a lawsuit or, or a court case almost every year. Um, and, and it's hard, right? People will say, well, they should have thought about that ahead of time. Like, well, they did, but they also thought about getting married ahead of time, and then they decided not to be married anymore. Um, so, you know, how, how do you make those kinds of decisions when people can't agree who should be the one um, who, who gets to prevail in that situation? So I'm not here to answer that question, but just to say those are the kinds of things that come up when you're, uh, when you're thinking about and talking about um, assisted reproductive technologies. Um, surrogate mothers, um, you know, in some cases, um, uh, somebody who does not, did not contribute the egg might be, uh, might be the person who is carrying to term um, a pregnancy does that person have any rights um, that are sort of, uh, that can't be severed um, to the child that after the child is born? And so some people will say, well, it wasn't her egg, it wasn't her partner's sperm, um, she was a don't, she was a, a surrogate, um, should not have those kinds of rights. And then on the other side of that, you might say, well, um, but the prenatal environment is also really important. The placenta is really important. The um, amniotic fluid is really important. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of issues that come up um, with all of these things and, and they're going to continue to come up um, and, and, you know, and we'll just have to figure them out as we go along. Um, when you think about um, genetic testing, you know, you know, would you like to know if there is a disease that you're likely to suffer from later in life? And some students will say yes and some students will say no. Um, and for the people who say yes, um, they'll say, well, I might be able to do something about it. And, and what is the thing that I could do about it? I could exercise more, I could eat better, I could, I could do the following things. There's some things that, uh, that none of that will help, um, but there's some things where it might. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about in class is like, well, we should all be doing that anyway. Um, but that's simplistic, right? And that uh, genetic counseling is really important so that people can really understand what it is that they might know and what it is that they're about to find out and then what to do with that information once they got it because it is a likelihood um, in adulthood and it's not a certainty or it's not always a certainty, although sometimes it is. Um, okay, um, so three uh, prenatal period, um, the germinal period, the embryonic period, and the fetal period. Um, your book does a terrific job of talking about those. Uh, I put in the slides a chart of um, how often, you know, what's the likelihood that a fertilized egg turns into a pregnancy that is carried to term. Um, and it's, it's astonishingly small. I remember when I first looked at these statistics, um, I was like, wow, you know, a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to not get pregnant if they don't want to be pregnant. Um, and yet we didn't realize necessarily how difficult it was to, uh, to sustain a pregnancy. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're, if you're using birth control, keep using it. Don't use this course to, uh, to, to sway you in one direction or the other. Um, but, you know, at every stage, um, there are all kinds of things that go wrong. 60% of fertilized eggs do not implant. Um, and so then, you know, with that, with that remaining 40%, there are a number of, of vulnerabilities that happen along the way. Um, and so only about 30% ever make it to full term. Um, and that's, you know, that's surprising. The other thing that surprised me was that um, half of 
of unrecognized pregnancies uh, miscarry. And I remember thinking about that. And I was like, well, if they were unrecognized, how did you do the research? Like if they didn't know they were pregnant, how could they tell you that they weren't pregnant anymore? Um, and the answer to that is they, um, there are markers in your, um, in your blood and in your urine that show, I think in your blood actually, um, that show that you were pregnant within the last 30 days. And as a consequence of other research that they were doing, they realized that there were women who had been pregnant within the last 30 days and didn't know it and, so they were, and who were no longer pregnant. Um, and so it was using those biological markers that enabled them to, um, to come up with those numbers. Okay, um, so the book does a good job talking about um, each of these periods, the germinal period, first two weeks, embryonic period, weeks three through eight, um, and the fetal period coming after that. The fetal period being largely a period of growth, and in particular brain growth, um, the uh, embryonic period um, is the formation of a lot of physical structures. And so um, when you look at the section on teratogens, the things that can go wrong um, because you were exposed to stress, exposed to the flu, exposed to a toxin, um, any number of things, um, depending on the timing, it'll have different effects, right? If it happened during the germinal period, it's very likely, and it was severe enough, it's very likely that the pregnancy would be terminated in a natural way. Um, if it happened during the embryonic period, you're likely to see um, physical malformations. And if it happens during the fetal period, you're likely to see uh, growth and development um, malformations and, uh, you know, and perhaps stunted in some areas. And so, um, you know, knowing those periods and knowing when something happens, um, a lot of people, you know, within the first two weeks, uh, first 10 days, don't know that they're pregnant, right? And so if they don't know that they're pregnant, they don't necessarily, and they weren't planning to be pregnant, they uh, don't necessarily know to, to avoid um, certain teratogens. Um, and so, um, so that's why it's uh, important to know those kinds of things. Um, uh, let's see, um, so teratogens. Um, and then the last thing in the chapter that I wanna talk about um, is uh, postpartum depression. Um, and I think that you know we hear high profile cases of postpartum depression, but um, it's a real thing, it's a real danger. Um, and 70% of people um, uh, who have just given birth, women who have just given birth, um, uh, uh, seem to have some symptoms of postpartum depression or postpartum blues. Um, so think about that, you know, if you know people who have just had a child or if you're somebody who's just had a child, 10% um, of people are gonna have, um, you know, postpartum full-on depression, but another 70%, so 80% um, are gonna be affected by this in some way. And so I think if it happens, to, for, the, for the person that it happens to, they may not be expecting it, um, and they may, uh, you know, it may be difficult for them. They may not think that they've got a support network. Um, and so you can be their support network or, or you can uh, find a support network um, if, that, if that's the case for you. Okay, um, so that's it for chapter two. Um, have a great week. Um, contact me as always if you've got any questions. Um, and in the next chapter, we'll be talking about um, early childhood development. Thanks, bye.